All right, we'll be in Revelation 5 still. Uh, today is going to be one of those days where I might have a little hard time explaining a couple things. Uh, one thing in particular, I'm still chewing on it as I speak. And uh, it's just it's one of those mysteries that I've never thought about before in the book of Revelation. Um, even just uh, in different parts of the Bible. And this morning the Lord just kind of revealed it to me, and uh, it, it just brought a lot of questions to me. So we'll, we'll see how the Lord directs that when we get there. But um, today we're going to be starting at verse 5. Last week, if you remember, we ended with, a, with a verse 4 that talked about how John wept so much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or even to look at it. And, and so it spoke to us how important the scroll was. And we looked last week as if the, the scroll does indeed refer to the Lamb's Book of Life and, and how he would have wept so much because no one was able to open the scroll, meaning that there was no means of salvation. But praise God, there is one, right? There is one that we have a means of salvation. And it has nothing to do with us whatsoever, but his name is Jesus Christ. So let's look at verse 5. And verse 5 reads, But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. So first and foremost, what I want to show you is this. Here it says, Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, right, stands and, and, and will prevail in all this. But I want you to look at verse 6. And we'll, we'll actually dive into verse 6 furthermore, but I just want to show you something. It says, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. But here one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. But in verse 6, when John looks and peers into the throne of heaven, he sees a lamb as though it had been slain. So here's the elders saying, you know, the lion of the tribe of Judah, but then John sees the lamb. So what's going on here? Well, what we've got to understand is that the lion describes who Jesus is right now. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He stands in victory. He reigns in victory like a lion. He is the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. The lamb describes why he is worthy to open the scrolls. The reason why he is worthy is because of his sacrifice that he made on the cross. And we're going to get into that a lot more. But um, I want to uh, point you to something else. You notice it says the root of David. So with that, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 2. I want to show you some prophecy here. And I'm going to explain a little bit more about prophecy in just a moment. But Isaiah chapter 11, again, the elder described Jesus as a lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. And again, it's very important we understand why he's described as a lion, but then again, why he's described as the root of David. And we know that David here is a king, David. So Isaiah 11, verse 1. It says, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Well, okay, first of all, we're talking about the root of David, but why were we talking about the stem of Jesse? Well, we know that Jesse is King David's father. So just talking about lineage here. So verse 2, it says, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So this was the seven spirits of God that we have been talking about last several weeks. Verse 3, His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. Well, praise God for that, right? Verse 4, But with righteousness he shall judge the poor. And decide with equity for the meek of the earth, he shall strike the earth with a rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, the young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. 
The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse who shall stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria and Egypt, from Pathros and Cush, from Elam and Shinar, from Hamath and the islands of the sea. He will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So this is again is a prophecy that Isaiah has spoken about, about Jesus Christ. About how he shall come from the lineage of David. Again, he refers to as Jesse here because again, Jesse is, is King David's father. Um, he goes into prophecy about his millennial reign about how there shall be perfect peace on the earth during that thousand years that, that Christ will reign on this earth. And the great thing is we get to reign with him during those thousand years. But again, I wanted to show you something concerning prophecy. And this is something the Lord spoke to me this morning. He says, not only does prophecy speak of him, but he also reveals himself through prophecy. In other words, not only does, does prophecy speak about Jesus and the things that he has fulfilled, the things that he will fulfill, but it's Jesus himself, because he is the word of God, is he not? So it's himself speaking his identity as prophecy identifies who he is. And again, he identifies himself as the root of Jesse, the, the stem of Jesse, here in uh, Revelation 5, the, the root of David. And, and so I wanted to show you one more thing before I dive a little bit further in this. Look up here at what Revelation twenty two sixteen says. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And again, this is Jesus Christ's own words here. So I began thinking about this this morning, and I never really thought about it. We always say that Jesus comes from the lineage of David. We always say that, right? He is the, the, the offspring of David. He is the, the root of David, the root of Jesse. But the Lord kind of lays something else on my heart this morning. He said, not only does he come from the root of Jesse, but he also is the root of Jesse. Meaning that a root is a source of something, right? A root is what feeds something. What this actually speaks of is not only does Jesus come from the lineage of King David's family, but he is also the creator of King David's family. And I never thought about that before until this morning when I spent some time with the Lord. So we see him as not only as the lineage of David, but we all see him as a creator of David's family itself. And I thought that was really, really, really interesting. And then so we go on and look at verse 6. And he says, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is where it's going to get really interesting, and I'm having a hard time with it. So, again, it says, a lamb as though it had been slain. So it is believed the way that John was writing this as how he saw Jesus as a lamb who had been slain is believed that what he's trying to say is that's how Jesus appeared before him, as though he had just been slain that the blood that was on him was still as fresh as the day that it occurred on the cross and even before that time on the cross when he was being tortured. So what it speaks to us today is, as, as John saw Christ as a lamb who had just been slain, that blood is still fresh for each and every one of us today. His blood has never dried up. We've got to understand that it is still running free and flowing with full of life today as it was then. And this is where it gets interesting. So notice Revelation 13, 8. It says, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So here is John in the throne room seeing Jesus as the lamb who had just been slain. All right. Now we know, again, Revelation 13, 8 describes Jesus as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Meaning from the very moment before God even created the heavens and the earth, as we see in Genesis 1, 1. Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. The plan of, sac of salvation was already put in motion. It was already in effect before we even needed it. Before we were even created, before we even needed grace and mercy, 
grace and mercy and salvation was already um, put before, before we ever even needed it. So now watch this. In 1 Peter 1.20, Peter says, He indeed, Jesus, was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these times for you, in these last times for you. So now, just, just, just hear me out and, and let's see where the, the Spirit goes with this, because I'm still having trouble with this. So, I'm thinking about Jesus, when I go before the throne room, all right? And I go into that throne room, and Jesus is before me. And I see him seated on the throne because he's seated in victory. I see him as John describes him in, in Revelation 1. The Son of Man, but yet completely glorified. It talks about how bright the glory is emanating from his being. Right? And that's how I picture him when I come into the throne. I see Jesus in all of his, his full splendor and his glory. And that's, again, John, was it one, or I'm sorry, Revelation 1, 14, 15, wherever it's at, is in, in Revelation 1. That's how John sees Christ. But now, here he is, referred to as the line of the tribe of Judah, but yet when, when John looks into the throne and he sees a lamb as though it had but just been slain, standing by the throne, in other words, standing beside the seated father, he says that he sees him as he has been slain. So I, I didn't think about this before, but this morning the Lord kind of like lay this on my heart. So I want you to think about something. I don't know where we're going with this, just bear with me. So here is Christ from the foundation of the world, slain. All right? We know that in Isaiah 52, 14, I think it is, it says that he was marred. He was disfigured more than any man upon this earth in an entire history. He was marred more than any other man, completely disfigured, right? Now, we know that is what it looks like from the foundation of the world. Now, just bear with me here. Jesus is also the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yesterday, from the foundation of the world, he was the lamb slain, meaning wounded, meaning disfigured, meaning marred. So, he is born upon this earth as a child, right? As a baby, he grows up as a child, becomes a human being. He looks just like all of us. No difference. Full man, yet full God, right? And then at 30, he starts his ministry, just like each and every one of us. Looks no different. And then he has to become slain. Again, marred more than any other man on this earth. Disfigured to where no one could recognize who he was upon that cross. He's, he dies, it gets put in the uh, tomb, tomb sealed. On the third day, he raises from the tomb, and he walks out. Now, there's a little bit of mystery going on what he actually looks like. We know that he's not fully spirit because he can't not touch a spirit. He says, touch my flesh, touch my bones, you can feel me. Flesh and blood is what a person has, not what a spirit has. So we know he is fully man and fully human at the time after his resurrection. Now, we also know that he wasn't fully marred and disfigured because he didn't like stand out from everyone else. So he was healed, but yet you could see his wounds in his hands and in his side. Now, could you always see those wounds? I don't know. Maybe he just wanted to show his disciples to fully show, hey, I am the risen Christ. I am prophecy fulfilled. I'm everything that I told you I would be. But then we know that 40 days he walks on this earth. Some recognize him, some didn't. On the road to Emos, his own disciples did not recognize him. And yet he walked beside them and talked to them. Not until he broke the bread was their eyes open. He's like, oh, yeah, you are Jesus. When, when the guys were fishing, he's on the shore. I don't know how far away it was, but they, yet they could not recognize his voice, did not recognize him as a person. And they spent three years with Jesus. So we know that, that his appearance looked different, but yet he was not fully marred. He gets risen into heaven, ascended into heaven. Now, in our minds, he's a glorified Christ. He is what Revelation 1 describes as, as son of man, but yet glorified, em emanating glory to the point it it's almost blinding light. But then John says, I see him, 
but he's like the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. And I'm wondering, what is the difference here? Here, when John first goes into heaven in that vision, he sees Jesus as a son of man completely glorified. But now he sees Jesus not necessarily completely glorified, but as a lamb who has just been slain. And so in my mind, what it's starting to speak to us about is this. It, it speaks of, this is going to be hard to say, but it, it speaks of, of the, the plan of salvation from the very beginning of time. It, it shows who Christ has always been. It shows who Christ is right now, and it shows who Christ will be for eternity. The lamb who was slain. When we think of a lamb who was slain, fully marred beyond all you know, comprehension, we, we think of a defeated slain lamb. He's not defeated. The wounds reveal his victory, right? So we got to get our mindset right that even though he, he looked fully marred before John, what we got to understand is what John saw was victory. Not only in Jesus' life to overcome death, sin, the enemy, and the grave, but also victory for John himself, knowing that because of this lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world, I have resurrected life coming to me. I have eternal life coming to me. And so I believe that's why the Lord allowed John to be able to see him as this lamb that was slain from the foundation to today, for to ever, forever, because that is always who Jesus Christ is and will be, is our sacrificial lamb. Meaning that when, oh, thank you, Lord. Meaning that when John gets to heaven and he sees Jesus in a vision, John understands the reason why I am in heaven standing right now is not because of anything this man has done. It's everything that I am seeing that Jesus Christ went through for me personally. So I was wondering how this applies to us today. The plan of salvation was Jesus Christ from the very foundation of the world. And Ephesians 1.4 says that we have been chosen from the very foundation of the world too. Not for, the, the, not for salvation, we understand that. I mean for salvation, but we're not the plan in it, right? But listen to what I've got to say. Come on, Lord, help me. From the very foundation of the world... God chose us for a calling and a purpose upon our life. I want you to think about your personal calling or purpose from God himself. What did that look like from the very foundation of the world? I want you to think about for a minute who God called you to be, what he called you to do, what did it look like from the very foundation of this world? Now, that was yesterday. We are in Christ, are we not? So today, that was yesterday in you, today in you, how much different do you look like now than what God called you to be in the very beginning? And then when you stand before Christ and you have that crown, hopefully, on your head, how much did you divert away from your calling a purpose upon your life that God sent in motion from before the very foundation of the world. Meaning, if you accomplish the calling a purpose upon your life, you have the crown to set before his feet. But if you do not uh, accomplish that calling a purpose upon your life, it doesn't necessarily speak about your salvation, but what it talks about is what you're going to have upon your head to lay at his feet if you did not fulfill your calling a purpose upon your life. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The calling on your life is still the same today as it was from the foundation of the world. You cannot screw it up. Listen to me. You cannot screw the calling and purpose of God on your life. You're not that powerful. I am not that powerful. The Word of God, Romans eleven twenty nine, 29, I think it is, says that His calling and His purpose upon our life are irrevocable. That means it is without repentance, means that God will never change His mind, 
by the very foundation of the world, when he saw Miss Evelyn, he's like, you know what? This is what I'm putting upon your life. This is your calling, and this is your purpose. You yourself, and this is what I'm putting. Then what he, he does is this. He sees the end of Miss Evelyn's life as she stands before him in full glory going, this is who I've always seen you as. So I want to ask you right now, if you could look back from the very foundation of the world and you see the calling and purpose that God has placed upon your life, knowing he was never going to take it away from you, but he placed it upon your life, what do you look like today compared to that person that he envisioned you to be from the very foundation of this world? And then... How much will you look like the very foundation of the world, that person he called you to be, in the very end? How much did you accomplish? Or was everything you accomplished was for your kingdom and not for his? That's, that's about as close as I can get with that. Let's go forward some more. So, it says that the Lamb is have been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Let's talk about the horns for a moment. In the Bible, horns represent power and might. This speaks of his, I'm going to probably butcher this word, om, omnipotence. This speaks of his omnipotence, how he is all-powerful and how he is almighty. His eyes... In the Bible, eyes represent wisdom and knowledge. I'm going to, okay. This reveals his omniscience. I think I say it right. Om, 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 omniscience. His omniscience. We'll go with that. His omniscience, meaning that he is all-knowing. We'll just break it down that far, all right? means that he is all-knowing. Now, when you think about the horns in his eyes, there's seven of them, right? Seven always represents fullness or completion. So what this means is that it shows, it represents the fullness of his power and his wisdom, not only in heaven, but also on earth. See, it goes on, it says, the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Look at what Zacharias says. For who has despised the day of small things? For these seven rejoice to see the plumb line and the hand of Zerubbabel. They are the eyes of the Lord which scan to and fro throughout the whole earth. And I think about that, right? How his eyes scan to and fro throughout the whole earth. Why is it that we don't ever declare that scripture? When I, I think about, and this is me personally, but when I think about what roams to and fro on this earth, I'm thinking of my adversary, the lion, who's trying to devour me. When I think, that's all I think about. I never think about how it's the eyes of the Lord that scan to and fro all about this earth. Now, does that comfort you or does that scare you? And that will dictate and represent your walk with the Lord, whichever it is. So let's go to verse 7. Verse 7 says, Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. So, again, just real quickly, the only creature in heaven or on the earth or under the earth that was found worthy to be able to take the scroll was the lamb that had been slain. The scroll and the lamb must have a common connection then. If he was the only one that was found worthy to even look at it, to open it up, to grab it, there's got to be a connection between the lamb and the scroll. Now, again, it's not just the lamb, but the lamb who had been slain. Now, verse 8. And this is probably where I'm going to end right here. I know it's short, but where we're going to go next week is a lot longer. I want to just kind of end it here. So, verse 8 says this. Now, when we had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bull, golden golden bowl, bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So here again it says, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. I want you just to look back at chapter 4 for a second. Chapter 4, verse 10 says this, 
The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne. Again, 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne. Who do we figure out who is the one sitting on the throne? Is it Jesus? No, because he is a lamb who is standing beside the throne. It's the Father. So in Revelation 4.10, John sees the 24 elders falling down before the Father who sits on the throne. Now, in chapter 5, verse 8, John is seeing the four living creatures and the 24 elders falling down before the Lamb. All right? So it doesn't necessarily mean that the Lamb now has, has greater authority than the Father, what I believe it possibly means is that the Lamb is now ready to exercise His authority. The 24 elders are looking at the Father who sits in complete and total sovereignty on the throne. As soon as this, the scroll is handed to Jesus, now all attention goes upon Jesus. Why? Because now all power and authority is in His hand, which means that He is the one who is about to exercise His authority upon this earth through His wrath. Again, the seals that is sealed up on that scroll, the seven seals, represent God's wrath. The only one who can open that seal is Jesus Christ himself. And it's, if you think about it, there, <laughs> God's wrath is in fact the plan of the fullness of salvation. Because his, his wrath still is, is to, it's a means to cause people to return back unto him. Yes, it's a means of punishment, but it's a means to get people to finally fall on their faces before him and go, look, we were wrong. We are sorry, God. You are the God of Israel. You are the, the great I am and all that. And so when you see the seals upon the scroll, if the scroll represents the Lamb's Book of Life, each seal represents each step of God's plan of salvation through the wrath of God, if you will. Sometimes the book of Revelation just gets way, way out there. So, and then to finish this up, it says that each of them had a harp. So, interestingly enough, it is the only instrument, the harp, in Revelation that is used as a means of worship. Now, the trumpet is seen a lot in the book of Revelation, especially in heaven. However, it is not meant for a means of worship. It's meant as a, as a warning, if you will, a, a warning sound. Um, it always accompanied singing in the Old Testament. Anytime you, you saw the harps being played, it always accompanied singing. It was one of the first instruments that was mentioned in the Bible. The original harp was actually much smaller and it could actually be transported. Now, I wasn't going to bring this because, again, you know me, i got to have at least three sources to bring something. But I couldn't find any more, but I will bring this forth because it's actually, it comes from the Mishnah, which is the Jewish oral Torah. So it's the Torah, but it's what they spoke and not what they wrote. And it's also the Jewish traditions. It's the oral Jewish tradition. So you got to understand something. Way back in, in the old days, they didn't have means of communication. Right, A lot of times they didn't even have papyrus to write down on because, of course, they were poor, constantly on the move. Nomads, if you will, the nomadics. But what they did, they, they would speak oral traditions to each generation over and over and over again. So just because it wasn't written down doesn't mean that they didn't have anything orally passed down. And so this comes from what has been orally passed down, but it's believed that King David had 7,000 Harps made for the temple. 7,000 harps made for the temple. And it is believed that you could hear that music for miles coming from the temple. And, and so I just thought, of, just thought about that for a second. Imagine that. You're close to the temple, right? You're, you're, you're miles away, but still you could probably almost see it on the horizon. And all you're hearing is a harps playing. 7,000 harps is a loud, loud bunch of instruments if you think about it. Now, what did we learn a couple of weeks ago as on earth as it is in heaven? Everything is a model or a pattern made here on earth that is of in heaven. So imagine what the glorious sound is like of 
that I'll just say of that many harps. We don't know how many harps. Well, we'll look into a couple more weeks about how many angels. Probably next week we'll see how many angels are, are encompassed around the throne of God. When you have all of this, these heavenly beings singing holy, 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 you have all of these instruments being played at the same time, there's not going to be any type of worship here on this earth that's going to compare to that. And finally... I want you to think about something. When you go before the throne of grace and you pour your heart out through prayer, how often does it feel like it hits the ceiling and bounces back down? How often do you come back out of the secret place going, I don't even know if you even heard me today, right? I mean, we're all human. Let's just, you know, tell the truth here, right? A lot of times it doesn't even seem like we're even penetrating the throne at all. It doesn't even seem like God is hearing our prayers at times. And it just seems like we're, we're very lonely and like, God, where are you at in this situation? It says that there were golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. The golden bowls full of incense are the prayers of the saints. Who's a saint? We all are, right? Anybody who is in Christ is a saint, right? The incense, which is the prayers of the Lord, describe a sweet aroma unto him. In other words, he sees our prayers as something sweet amongst him. When you pray unto him, it's like sweet aroma coming up into the throne room. And I thought about this when I'm in the throne room, right? When I leave the throne room, which you should actually always abide in the throne room, but just, you know, bear with me for a minute. But let's say you're, you're before the Lord, pouring out your heart unto Him, and then you get up and you go back to life, if you will. What does the throne of God look like? Because according to this, it should be full of the smoke of incense. It should be so smoky that, that the way you pour it out should be such a sweet aroma that you have brought unto the throne of God Himself. But how many of us leave something different? Maybe it doesn't smell so hot before the throne of God. Does your prayer even put off any type of incense of smoke at all before Him? When we leave, uh, I'm trying to use the right word here, I'm hearing the Lord speak to me about, but are we just leaving a pile of dung in front of the throne as we leave the throne room? What that represents is complaints, grumblings, frustrations. You see, the, the sweet incense is thanksgiving and, and, and praise. When you go before Him with thanksgiving and praise, you fill that throne up with, with nothing but incense, smoke of incense, a sweet aroma unto Him. You want to please God? It says, without faith it's impossible to please Him. You want to please Him? Go before Him in your most horrible, terrible circumstance. Go before Him and go, Lord, I love you, I praise you, I thank you. I don't see what you're doing right now, but it doesn't matter because faith comes without seeing, right? i got to walk by faith, not by sight. So I don't care what I'm looking at right now, Lord. All I care about is who you are, who you are in my circumstance, and I don't care what things look like right now. I'm going to praise you because I know I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You've never left me nor you've forsaken me, and you're going to see me through this circumstance. That is what's going to fill the throne of praise with the incense of smoke, smoke of incense, however you want to say it. So, with all that being said today, I want you to think about this. Who God created you to be before He formed you in the womb of your mother. From the foundation of the world when He chose you to do whatever He has called you to do. First of all, who do you think that person is? Who do you think He called that person to do? And as you're living this moment, trust me, it's not a coincidence. Are you fulfilling what he called that person to do? Are you, as a child of God, going before him in the throne room, filling it up with the incense of smoke? Sweet aromas unto him. As you take your final breath and you stand before him, and we surround Him 
Are you going to have anything on your head that's a crown that was given to you at the Bema Seat of Christ as a reward for you for fulfilling your calling and a purpose for Him and His kingdom? Are you going to have anything on your head that you will get to lay at His feet thanking Him that He is the only reason for it anyway? As we stand before Him, do we see Him as a lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world? Meaning, the only reason why you're able to even stand in the Father's presence is because of Christ Himself. It has nothing to do with what we have done, who we are, nothing. It's everything about Christ. Seek Him this week and see what He shows you. Amen?